Continuamos entonces invitando a pasar al doctor Mark Schoen, director de la Oficina de Cumplimiento y Operaciones del Campo de la Comisión de Seguridad de Producto de Estados Unidos, de la cual no solo es responsable de la dirección de la sede de la comisión y de sus dependencias, sino también de las investigaciones de productos de consumo, regulados y no regulados, potencialmente defectuosos. Justamente ese es el tema que el doctor Schoen va a tratar esta, esta mañana, la identificación y reducción de los riesgos y peligros. Recibámoslo, por favor, con un fuerte aplauso. Good morning. Carol is a very hard act to follow, but I'm going to try to do my best. And I know it's getting late, so I tend to talk fast. Hopefully the translators will be able to keep up with me. I've got 40 years at the US Consumer Product Safety Commission, and I've got to put that into about uh, 30 minutes or 45 minutes. So first, I want to thank the sponsors and the hosts for inviting me. Uh, specifically, I also want to thank Christina, uh, Carmen, and Carolina. Uh, Carolina for uh, taking care of me and making sure that I got here safely and uh, I'm very pleased to be here in your country it's a beautiful country uh, I'm going to talk this morning about a couple different things uh, after lunch I'm going to talk about recalls which is my area as the deputy director of office of compliance and field operations at the US Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, but this morning I'm going to talk about risk assessment and how the agency deals with incidents and safety information that comes in. Uh, we are, the agency, CPSC is 45 years old, and I would be the first to admit that we don't know everything about product safety, but a lot of the steps that we have taken can guide the new countries who are just getting into product safety so that you can avoid some of the problems that we have faced over the years. Uh, one of the things that we have realized early on is you need to have a way to look at data. Data is the key to figuring out what safety problems exist in any global economy. Uh, so we've broken down our data through information that comes into the agency through a risk assessment where we look at the different pieces of information and then we have what we call a risk management where we will decide basically what do you now do with the data that comes in that may indicate a safety issue or a concern. Uh, also, many of you are in the, you're all in the consumer product safety area. You, you can't always fix every problem, which is another reason why you want to focus on the most serious risk of injuries that are presented to consumers. Uh, CPSC will look at the most vulnerable population, infants, babies, children. And Carol pointed out a number of actions that we've taken with respect to cribs and fireplaces. One of the things that the agency has done most recently is figuring out with wiseness and age comes, you can't see it anymore, so I have to use my glasses. This used to be so much easier for me, but now the, the print is so small, I can hardly see it. Uh, the, the first area is the centralized web-based searchable system. In 2008, CPSC created saferproducts.gov, which was a website that all consumers could go into online and put incident data in. So we encourage consumers to give us the data. Uh, previously, they used to call us on an 800, a toll-free number, or they used to send us a letter, and some consumers still do that. But more and more consumers are comfortable going on to our website and giving us incident data or accident data. Uh, what we realized 45 years ago was we have 15,000 different consumer products. We don't do food, we don't do drugs, we don't do boats, we don't do planes, uh, but we know cosmetics, but we do all other consumer products. 
and there are about 15,000 of them. So we needed to establish a way to distinguish between different products so that toys would not be confused with appliances. Appliances will not be confused with outdoor uh, sporting equipment. So we standardize a product code system as well as provided an injury type f based upon the incident information that was coming. Uh, we established uh, many years ago what we call an integrated team, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, in which various members of the agency with different disciplines look at all incoming data on a daily basis. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you applies not only for a government agency, but it's the same advice and guidance that I give to manufacturers and retailers. The government has a responsibility to oversee what the companies do. The laws that CPSC administers are targeted to manufacturers, importers, distributors, and retailers, and we oversee that. But we don't want to just catch the company doing something wrong. We want to educate them and advise them how they can do it right or do it better. Uh, we also, based upon our databases, we are able to go back and look at the 45-year history of the agency to see what kind of information has come in. We have four categories of data that we collect. Uh, injury and potential injury incident data, that's any news clipping, that's any consumer complaint, that's any report from a government official, that's all types of data that comes into our agency goes into this IPII database. Deaths are very important to us. We need to understand what the scenario, the hazard scenario was when a person is killed by a consumer product. So we have a separate database uh, for deaths. Every state in the United States is required to give us death information, but usually that's a year or two year later. So we have a voluntary program with medical examiners and coroners around the United States where we ask them to provide us product-related deaths only, and we get a large number of that type of information. I've got field investigators around the United States. I have about 95 field investigators around the country that can go talk to consumers who experienced a product-related incident. They can go in and inspect companies, they can go in and do retail surveillance, and they also do domestic internet surveillance. So we have another database where consumers complain to us, we can send an investigator out, oftentimes that same day that they complain to us, to collect facts. Because again, the most important thing that we need is data and if we don't go back to the consumer who took the time to complain about an unsafe product, then we may miss that information. So we go out, we collect it, we collect the sample where we can, and that sample then proves very valuable to us because it may tell a story. Uh, just like the, the, the detective or criminal TV shows, we can do a forensic analysis of the sample that was involved in a death or an injury and try to figure out was it a product defect, was it the way the consumer used the product, or was it labeling, mis mislabeling, or something else that was going on. And then finally, we have what we believe to be one of the more significant databases using hospitals around the United States called the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, or NICE. We have about 100 hospitals that provide us on a daily basis emergency room incidents involving consumer products. And from that, we can take the incident data that we get daily and make trend projections on what products are most likely to cause injury to consumers in the United States. As you can imagine, I think falls from stairs are number one. A lot of people around the United States fall climbing up or going downstairs, and then they end up in the hospital emergency room. Bicycles, as you can imagine, bicycles are very popular. So we get a lot of emergency room injuries from bicycles. Uh, for product defect identification purposes, NICE system doesn't work that well. 
because for product defect, we need product-specific information, make, model, brand, but, and, and we use the other databases to identify defective products. But for any global economy to have a better understanding of what's happening around its country, it needs to be hooked in, I believe, to hospitals. Hospitals are the key to identify whether or not there's misuse, whether or not there's a, a potential problem that needs to be addressed through information and education, or a industry standard, or even a mandatory standard. This is a map of the United States, and it shows you the hospitals that are listed, the locations of the 100 or so hospitals. And what we have is a mix of large, small pediatric hospitals, some specialty hospitals, and the idea again is to get a statistically valid number of injuries and deaths that occur around the United States. And with that information, almost every other government agency in the United States uses our data to show how many injuries are occurring how many deaths are occurring with products, consumer products. That also helps justify our budget when we're able to show that actual injuries and deaths are occurring involving consumer products. It's not always easy to go to our U.S. Congress and get money because everybody, every agency in the government wants money. Uh, CPSC is a very small agency in relative terms in the United States government. We have about 545 employees, and we have a budget of about 123 million US dollars. Uh, that's what our, some agencies spend in an hour. So we're very small, and unfortunately, consumer product safety has not always been at the top of the, of the uh, agenda for a lot of people. I was pleased to hear that the superintendent in his conversation this morning talked about the importance of product safety and holding government accountable. We hold our government accountable to make sure that the companies are following the rules and following the regulations. That, that was a sign of uh, good, I guess. I'm on the right track, thank you. Uh, I'll talk about the risk assessment process a little bit. Uh, again, it goes back to the data collection. It goes to the scope. Product hazard population. What is involved? What is the scope? How extensive? How narrow? Uh, can we identify the specific hazard? Uh, and then ultimately, we're going to characterize what the risk is based upon the factors that we know. So the more data that we can collect, the more quality data that we can collect, uh, it's helpful. That's why we do those in-depth, what we call in-depth investigations, where we go back to a consumer. The consumer may send us a email notice or a web notice that their, their child or they were injured by a product. They may not include any specific information. What were they doing at the time? What was their understanding of the instructions? Is, is there more information that we can obtain by going out on site and doing that in-depth investigation? And with, within the United States, it's very rare that a federal investigator or a federal agent will go into somebody's house in the United States unless that person's in trouble. So we're the only agency that goes to get information that we hope will help identify unsafe products. So as a result, we do about 5,000 visits to consumers a year, and the consumer generally is happy to see us because we're not the internal revenue service that wants to collect taxes, and we're not the marshal, the US marshal, that's going to arrest them. So when they find out what we're there for, they're happy to give us information about the product. I mentioned to you that we have integrated teams at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. These are teams that are broken down by specific product uh, areas, uh, chemical, children, combustion, electrical, fire. We, we recognize that seniors are a growing trend and uh, population in the United States and, and mechanical issues always face uh, seniors. Uh, and what we have are various disciplines throughout the agency, human factors, engineering sciences, health sciences, 
compliance plays a major role, lab as well as hazard analysis, our Office of Epidemiology. So what we realized early on is that as a compliance person, I can look at the product and the risk and the injury in one way. But if I bring a Carol uh, Pollock Nelson along, she gives me a whole new perspective of what happened in that incident. Something that my view may not have seen, she can pick out. Mechanical engineers are the same way. Even lawyers bring a different view to the whole equation so that as we sit as a team and we look at the, I don't know, about the 2,500, 3,000 product related incidents that come in every week to the agency from all sources, we can go through that as a team and decide which ones do we need more information on, which ones do we want to do an in-depth investigation on, which ones do we want to give to compliance right away, and I'll send an investigator out to the company because something doesn't look right here, based upon just initial information that we've gotten from a consumer. This is where we try to determine the scope. Now again, we're, we're looking at raw data, uh, it's data that's coming in from many different sources. So we're, we're looking at, is this a product-specific problem or could it be industry-wide? If we start to see a bicycle injuries coming from various hospitals, coming from consumer complaints, and it all leads to one brand of bicycle, that is a pretty good clue that there may be something wrong with that bicycle. But then we also want to look different. Could it be the way it was installed? Could it have been the instructions because it wasn't being followed? One of the things we saw early on was when a retailer like a Walmart or a Kmart or Sears installs bicycles or assembles the bicycles uh, themselves, have their own employees assemble the bicycles, I think they saw more incidents as people started riding the bicycle out. But when they hired a company, a third party company, to come into their stores and do the assembly of the bicycle, they saw less problems with the bicycles. So again, it's that kind of look and investigation that you have to do to look at the data. Just because someone says, my bicycle fell apart, you need to dig deeper. You need to figure out how was it assembled, what were the instructions, what was the design. And then we also have to identify who is most at risk. So we now have the hazard identification and the characterization. Uh, we've got the data collection. We're looking at uh, trying to identify the failure mode, whether it's a specific component on a product or is it the whole product? Is it the steering wheel of the bicycle? Or is it the bicycle itself, the way it was assembled and put together? Uh, what is the, who is the user? Who's a vul whether it's a vulnerable population? Is it the elderly? Is it children? Is it just you and me? Uh, what are environmental factors? Were they distracted? Was it being used in the rain, in the snow? Is there something else that contributed to that incident? So we, the integrated teams that we've developed are looking and digging a little bit deeper. Now, I think a lot of you may be familiar with the RAPIC system that's used throughout the European Union, and we've called upon that. We draw upon the European RAPIC system to assist us in making overall risk assessments. Uh, we don't necessarily use it for product defects. For product defects, it's a, a specified type of criteria and factors that we use uh, based upon the, the law that we administer with respect to product defects. But the RAPIC system for all the data that comes in will give us a good indication of whether or not we need a product safety standard or some type of regulation or even a product ban. Uh, we also have banned some products through the years, uh, very few, but, but some where there just is no safe use of the product. Uh, the, the one that specifically comes to mind would be lawn darts. These were a metal tipped uh, dart that you basically, is about a 12 to 18 inch metal tip that you, d you would throw at a target. Unfortunately, when you threw it, you had no control of whether or not the target was going to be hit. And if there are children or bystanders standing around, 
more than uh, more than once, unfortunately, the metal tip went into somebody's brain and almost killed them instantaneously. So that was a product that was banned many, many years ago. Uh, and that's why I said th there's some products that you can't deal with, and there's some other products that you have to take some very drastic action. If the company won't do it, then I think, I believe, at least in my experience, then it's the role of the government to step in to do the protection. We then get into the exposure element, where we specifically are looking at how many products were distributed, uh, what is the product lifetime. If a product is going to be around forever, we, as a, a U.S. government agency, believe that the product should not fail in an unsafe manner. And not every company who designs a product or makes a product designs safety into the product so that when it fails, it fails in an unsafe manner. It should not be a catastrophic failure uh, if, it's a, if it's a gas can or if it's a water heater and it cracks and you're exposed to a, a fire or a flame, I mean, that's not a very good thing. So what we encourage companies to do, again, is to design safety into the product. Think about not only the life of the product and the use of the product, but what happens when the product ends? Uh, who is going to be at risk, if anybody? And if there's a, a issue there, it may be something that the consumer has to re, or the company may have to recall the product. We also look at the, the behavior of the, pro, of the consumer and whether or not it's reasonably foreseeable that the product should act in such a manner, and as well as what is the consumer's expectation. So again, a lot of this hinges on what Carol talked about with respect to human factors. And what we encourage companies to do is to design safety into the product. It is so much easier to deal with the problem beforehand than once it gets out into the marketplace, and we'll talk about recalls a little bit later. Uh, here we go into risk characterization. We have to determine the risk based upon the probability and, so and severity. So using the RAPEX formula, we'll look to see whether death is likely, whether it's a serious injury, whether it's first aid, whether medical treatment is or is not necessary. But then the only way that you can get to that point is to have the body of data coming into your organization or into a company. I mean, we expect a company a manufacturer, an importer, a retailer, we would expect them to design their company around data uh, so that when we talk about being a data-driven agency, uh, a company should also be data-driven. Here again, taken from the RAPEX formula, we look at the risk characterization matrix. We assign whether or not it's a serious risk, a high risk, a medium risk for purposes of uh, of determining whether or not any action is necessary. Now, I understand Joseph Tus is going to be uh, giving a course Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday that many of you may be at, and this is one of the models that he will use to talk about how you make this risk characterization or this risk assessment. Uh, because I may think that something is very serious, but then when you put it into perspective on how it's being used who the population is, what the purpose of the product is. Maybe it's got a very legitimate purpose, notwithstanding the risk. There are some products that are riskier than others, and, and it may be a vital or a critical product. So we're going to look at, and Joseph, during his course, looks at all those perspectives so that we're, we're making things in a uniform uh, standardized way. We're making decisions in a standardized way. Uh, one of the worst things that industry tells me that they hate is when the government comes along and says, today the product is good, but tomorrow the product is bad. So we have to have a formula. We have to have a criteria. We have to be able to show why we believe the product is good or the product is bad. This is our internal to CPSC. This is our integrated team process flow where we take the data in, we do some triage of it, we do an initial review of the data, and then we have an investigation phase so that we do investigate the pro during the process. After the investigation is complete, and this can take anywhere from a few days to about 25 days during this process, because everything, because it's incoming injuries, incoming deaths, 
incoming incidents that have the potential to cause injury. Uh, it's an expedited process. Uh, so everybody on the integrated team, they also have other jobs at the agency, but they look at this as a needed function. Uh, and we'll look to see where do we send that incident data, where do we send that, that information. Does it go out for a public safety campaign or outreach? Uh, could there be a standard that's needed, a mandatory standard or a regulation? Uh, or re refer it for corrective action, which is refer to compliance. So some of the data that comes through may indicate a product defect, may indicate a product failure. And in that case, compliance would get it do further investigation and get back to the company to find out what was going on. Uh, not all our data has any action going forward. We get a lot of data that provides information for the use, for our use in the future, but it may not indicate a need to take action right then and there. So here we get into risk monitoring. So after all this data comes in, there's a body of data that we will use, and then there's some other data that's just out there that we kind of store away to remember for later because additional data may come in that may at some point support some type of action. Uh, but the agency, at least CPSC, is involved not only in data collection, but taking that data, they will then look at a voluntary industry consensus standard. And hopefully you understand what I mean when I say a voluntary industry consensus standard. There are government mandated regulations, there are government mandated standards, and then there are hundreds if not thousands of industry consensus standards. Now while we call these voluntary, in my world of compliance, eh, if you don't meet it, and every other manufacturer is meeting that voluntary standard and you don't meet it and you're causing injuries, then I will be knocking at your door and asking why are you not meeting this voluntary standard? Because it's become so uh, typical that everybody is using it, the best practice would indicate that to have the safest product and the less risky product, you need to meet these performance standards whether it's voluntary or not. Uh, if 10 companies are meeting it and one is not, I'm going to ask that company why they're not, and I probably will make them take some action to meet the voluntary standard. Uh, one of the main reasons why it's still called a voluntary standard is because in order to establish a standard in the US, it takes three to five years at a minimum. It's a very long process because we do have due process. Companies can object, companies can, can talk, consumers can come in and object as well and talk about what we can and can't do. Whereas just if we go through a voluntary standard, whether it's the ASTM or ANSI or Underwriters Laboratory, uh, these are all standards uh, organization, they bring in all affected parties, government, consumers, business, and together we craft a voluntary standard. We come up with what we believe to be the best standard. And we've just gone through that process with liquid laundry packets. I don't know if everyone is familiar with the liquid laundry packet. It's put out by companies like Procter & Gamble, Tide. Instead of pouring liquid into your, lawn, your washer or powder, they have little concentrated uh, packets that are very colorful and bright and because of that, a lot of kids were putting them in their mouth and ingesting them. So you have a, a, a and you also have the appearance that it's candy. It's got the, the Tide colors for soap is red, blue, and yellow, I think, or orange. So it's very bright and it looks very attractive. It's a new type product. So the consumer groups and manufacturers and the government has been working with this industry for the last four years maybe, three and a half, four years. Uh, we started with a corrective action plan put out by my office where the companies had to put warning labels and safety labels as well as uh, do things to the packaging to make them look less attractive. It then shifted to the ASTM voluntary standards process where over the last year and a half they've been working at coming together 
manufacturers, consumers, and the government together to develop a performance standard that will further reduce risk of injury from poisoning and from eye injuries. And I just got an email this morning that indicated we now have an agreement on a voluntary standard that may be effective as early as September 15th. So a lot of work that Carol has done, that our offices have done, and others have done, have come together to create what we believe to be, will be a safer liquid laundry packet. Uh, and why do we even have liquid laundry packets? Think about it. Everybody can pour the liquid into the washing machine. They can take the powder and pour it in. But industry likes to create new products. And they believe that we are so lazy that we now need a liquid packet to pick up, drop it into the washing machine because it's too hard to pour it and it's too hard to scoop it. So this is the, what we have to deal with as government employees, as government regulators. There is no end to the types of products that companies will try to come up with. And it's important, I think, that we try to stay, if not even, at least one step ahead of them to try to figure out and look at the problems that could occur from this type of product. Uh, we also have here technical regulations. Uh, CPSC uh, can create a, a regulation and enact a regulation if the industry won't come together as a voluntary standard. And again, this all is given to us by data. Data is what drives every action that the agency has and what the agency does. And so if you don't have your data gathered together, you need to get that data as, as quickly as you can to try to figure out where to start. Uh, we will look at the outcomes of a voluntary standard. We will look at the outcomes of a regulation to see whether or not it's, it's working or if it's even needed. Sometimes best business practices take over so you don't even need the regulation or the voluntary standard anymore. In my last slide, I wanted to show you uh, the CPSC National Product Testing and Evaluation Center. We uh, built a new lab about four years ago, five years ago, that we're real proud of. But one of the things that I try to explain to not only other government regulators, but also um, companies, is that we don't use the lab just to test. This is our real forensic laboratory. This is where we do investigations. This is where we do uh, product identification, product hazard. Anybody can build a lab and anybody can have a test equipment and run the product through and figure out whether it meets the requirement or not. But it's a lot harder, but I think much more satisfying if you use your technical staff, your lab staff. And we've got engineers, we've got health scientists, we've got physiologists, we've got uh, structural engineers, we've got mechanical engineers, uh, we've got epidemiologists, we've got chemists, we've got scientists. They all contribute by looking at the data to determine how can we reduce injuries? How can we prevent in deaths? I've been doing this, I, get, I told you, over 40 years. And it, for me, it's been all about going home at night worrying about the death that's going to occur or the injury that's going to occur because of a decision I made that day in either letting a company continue to sell a product, uh, not recalling the product, or not banning the product. So this is something pretty heavy that all of us as government regulators have to think about almost on a daily basis. How do we get to the point where we can not only test the product, but we can investigate and we can identify the hazard before it hurts too many people and then have the action that we can take against the company or against the industry to make sure that they can follow the rules, uh, meet the standard, and make the product as safe as you can. Uh, so again, in summary, it's don't just test the product, just don't have a test lab. Use your, your laboratory as your identifier of the risk and the hazard. Uh, you need to monitor the products that are out there, identify where you may need a standard or a regulation, uh, and look to industry not always to be the enemy. Uh, again, another lesson I've learned over the years, when I started this job, I figured industry was the enemy. They were the, the evil people because they were putting all these products out. Uh, maybe I've matured or I've seasoned over the years, but what I've understood now is 
they're consumers just like you and me. They're mom and dads, uh, brothers and sisters just like you and me. Uh, they want to put out safe products. Yeah, they want to make some money, so we always have to remind them that the money they make sometimes has to go into making sure the product is safer. But to the extent that we can, we need to pull them along, work with them on showing them how the product can be made safer, and then unfortunately, if it doesn't turn out to be as safe as we expected, work with them on getting the product out of consumers' hands. So that's a very quick uh, discussion that I've, I've given you this morning on uh, risk and data, that we, how we use it at the CPSC. Uh, later on, I will talk about what happens when this data turns into a need for a recall, and we'll discuss that as well. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.